This is Keys to the Shop, episode 363, Setting Boundaries in the Coffee Shop with Tom Henschel. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. I'm really excited to have you along today. Thank you for tuning in, all of you who have been following along with the show all these years. So appreciate you, and big welcome to those of you who are just tuning in to Keys to the Shop. It's been a wild ride for the last five and a half years. We're almost at two million downloads. Uh, you know, show wide and yeah, we just keep going and, and it's because of folks like you. So thank you so much. And don't forget to subscribe to the show. That way you get updated with all the new episodes that come out each and every month. And we do try to make a lot of great and interesting content for you. And uh, subscribing would be uh, the best way to keep in touch. Now, also, it's really helpful for the show to share these episodes with a friend or with your colleagues or just on social media. Tag Keys to the Shop on Instagram or on LinkedIn and uh, let people know that there's this show that really focuses on helping the specialty retail coffee community. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who has already done that. Now, one of the things that I know is absolutely key for success in the specialty coffee industry, in the retail coffee industry, is clarity of your goals and knowing how to prioritize your time and resources, developing yourself as a leader, developing your team, your operations, your quality, your people. All of these things kind of come together to create what is a great coffee shop, a great coffee business. And that's what Keys to the Shop Consulting is all about helping you achieve. Keys to the Shop Consulting can walk along with you whether you're starting your first coffee business and need a trusted advisor to help you navigate that process or you are an established operator and you need to level up or solve some problems or you have special projects that you know are going to lead to some really great things in your business. Keys to the Shop Consulting can work with you either remotely or in person to help your business thrive. I would really love to talk with you. Let's set up a free discovery call. All you need to do is email chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C H R I S at keys to the shop.com. And in this conversation, we'll just talk about where you're at in the industry and how keys to the shop consulting can help you. Again, that email for keys to the shop consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, one of the things that's really fun and is really an adventure in coffee is the taste of coffee. Getting to explore the terroir and the flavors of each origin that you bring in. And so being able to get the most from your coffee is absolutely essential. And that's why I love the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee. The Ground Control Brewer uses its award-winning technology to give you control over an incredible range of flavors in your extractions. And it unlocks the potential of your coffee like no other brewer, changing the game for what we can expect from a batch brewer. But it also opens up a ton of efficiency and profitability because it can also brew tea, batched ice lattes, batched cold brew. The extraction potential of this machine is off the charts. And so you can visit them over at groundcontrol.coffee to learn more who's using this machine, what it's all about. And so if you are interested in leveling up the quality of your coffee and your customer's experience with your coffee, all while also increasing your profitability and efficiency on bar and having a really cool machine to look at as well, then I definitely think you need to consider the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer for your cafe. Again, check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee. You know, so much of coffee is about community. It is about sharing. It is about communal experiences. And I love it when companies are able to come alongside existing communities and serve their needs well. Uh, and there is that community of professional baristas. There's also a community of people who are customers who enjoy plant-based beverages. And when they come to a coffee bar with these great baristas, they want to see that talent and they want to see that great coffee shine through, whether they're using oat, soy, almond, all of it, they want the great coffee experience. And that I think is exactly what makes the Pacific Barista series so successful and the choice of so many professionals around the world because it's created for them. It is created for baristas and tested by some of the world's best before it even hits your counter. So you know it performs on bar by standing up to the heat from steaming, producing amazing silky texture for latte art, and also creates a lot of balance in the beverage. So the coffee really shines and your customers 
uh, just fall in love. And that's what you want, right? So go visit them over at pacificfoodservice.com to find out more and get samples in your shop today. If you're looking to serve the best plant-based beverages out there, then you need to be using the Pacific Barista Series. Okay, everybody. Well, today we are going to be talking about a subject that I, I think is so relevant um, in, in our industry of coffee. We need to always have this conversation as we grow our businesses, as we uh, get to know ourselves and others better, we need to talk about boundaries. We need to talk about personal and professional boundaries and how to set them up in the first place. It's a hard conversation because, you know, we're busy and oftentimes we just kind of acquiesce to the, the easiest thing, which is to kind of just not talk about it and, and let ourselves and our boundaries just go until we can't take it anymore. And then it's just another story altogether. We don't want to be there. We want to uh, overcome that challenge and here today to help us overcome that by really thinking through boundaries and what they are, how to set them and first steps in that process is our good friend, Tom Henschel, a frequent guest on the show and someone who has so much wisdom around this topic. Now, Tom is an expert in workplace communications and executive development. And for over 25 years, he has helped hundreds of senior leaders achieve the look and sound of leadership, which is the name of his podcast, the look and sound of leadership. It is wonderful. You should absolutely uh, subscribe to it. His expertise as a communications coach has taken him into executive offices of companies like Citigroup, HP, Intuit, Dole, Sony Pictures, Warner Brothers, and many more. In addition to coaching executives, Tom facilitates team events and delivers highly interactive trainings in the areas of effective communication, presentation, and influence skills. And like I said, his podcast, The Look and Sound of Leadership, has been airing since 2008. It is consistently cited as uh, what's hot in the business podcasts on iTunes. In our previous conversations with Tom, uh, episode 52, we talked about solving coworker conflict. And then in episode 104, we talked about how to deliver difficult feedback. Now, today we're going to be talking about boundaries. Why do we need to set them? What's the risk in not setting boundaries? How do we prepare ourselves and be thoughtful about setting our values and our boundaries? What about corporate boundaries versus personal? There's a lot to discuss. And as always, I'm glad to have somebody like Tom here to help us unpack this very important issue. So let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation about setting boundaries with Tom Henschel. All right, Tom Henschel, welcome back to Keys to the Shop. A thrill to have you uh, back on the podcast, Tom. How are you? Oh, I'm so glad to be back. I, I cannot tell you, I love the conversations you and I have had. I really feel the same way, and uh, today's is not going to be any different, I think. We've chatted a little bit off the recording about what today's topic is concerning, uh, boundaries, at work. And, um, it is my experience that there is a lot of unspoken angst existing in the workplace <laughs> between bosses and employees, uh, whether it's coffee bars or corporate work. Um, we, we all have unspoken rules and, and lines that we just, people cross and we, we kind of hold it in and I heard your episode about boundaries and thought we really need to dig into this on the show because in the coffee bar, um, I hear it all the time from baristas. I hear it from owners. And so a very, very relevant topic. Um, so excited to chat about this. Me too. I, it's been an important part of my life. I talk about it with my clients. Yeah, I'm thrilled we're talking about it. So thanks. Let's define what boundaries are, I guess, first. Um, before we get mm. into the the mechanics of it and uh, those types of things, what it, what are boundaries? What's in your definition of boundaries? Boundaries are the space between you and me, and where I draw a line around my values. So boundaries are protection. Boundaries, I protect my values when I set a boundary with you. I don't know if that's too simple or too complex. I think it's pretty simple, but maybe the simplicity of it is why we don't really create them <laughs> or enforce them. I, I don't know, but we want things to be pretty complex maybe, but why Why is it with something so simple, hey, I've got some values, I've got some space, 
why don't I tell nobody about it and then get mad? Um, why right. do we do this? <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I, you know, when I think about myself, I don't know, in college and after college, I, I didn't really know what my values were. I didn't really know what was really important to me. I knew what looked important to me, but you know what I mean? Like I was exploring still. I had many changes. My values changed a lot. Um, and I think that's a fine an exploration. I do. But also it let me off the hook around setting boundaries. I was horrible at it. I, I didn't want to do it. And so I didn't protect my values very well. Can I ask how you knew you were bad at it? Is it just for you know, hindsight now? Did you know then? I think I knew, I think I did know but I don't, don't think I knew what to do about it. And so I wished I were stronger. I wished I were firmer. I watched others um, and I was like so admiring of them. Like, oh, I, I would like to talk like that. Um, I remember one of my friends in particular watching her with her kids and she was so simple and clear and direct and loving. And I was like, I would like to talk like that. That was really clear boundary <laughs> setting. It was fantastic. I I wanted to be like that. Well, I suppose then you are kind of the archetype of of what a lot of us feel is in that there is a, a knowledge of what you would like. There's an ideal, and rather than executing on that and saying oh, I'm going to start tomorrow doing that, <laughs> um, we, we just say uh, maybe I'm. It's a fearful thing, and and I've. What I've learned to sort of function this way, so maybe it's the devil you know, sure. you know, than the one you don't. So sure. what's behind that? Well, I just think it's hard to. First, I've just gained the awareness. I mean, you you said to me, "Did I know that I was bad at it?" And the answer is, I I, I did sometimes, not all the time, but I did sometimes where I wished I had been stronger or I felt some kind of collapse. But I'm also aware that much of it was not conscious. I often didn't know when my boundaries were being violated. I I was kind of compliant and complicit and not in a guilty way. Can I put a framework around this? Because it's how I kind of think about this. I think, Chris, that all of us are somewhere on a continuum that has two ends to it. And at the one end are people like I'm talking about, like I was for a long part of my life. And where I just wasn't good at it, boundaries were violated and it was okay with me and I wasn't very good at it. And then there's on the way other end of the spectrum kind of dragons who set boundaries all the time and that's kind of all they do and they're highly protected and uh, it's hard to be intimate with those people, it's hard to be close to them because they have so many boundaries. I think we're all somewhere along that continuum. Nobody's right on the midline. And so I was way down on the kind of doormat side. And that's where I lived my life. And of course I knew it. On some level, I knew it. I knew that there were times when I didn't ask for what I want and I paid a price for it. In, I, I suppose that it's easy for somebody who recognizes their uh, being a doormat to jump all the way over to the other side of being a dragon. <laughs> it's always going to be incremental, gaining some awareness, trying it a little better the next time. How did that go? Gaining some awareness, trying a little better next time. Mm. I mean, yeah, of course, it is always incremental because partly, again, when we think about it, it being connected to values, that's really what motivates the change in behavior. But behavior doesn't change quickly, just as our values don't change quickly. And so it needs to be so intentional and thoughtful. And I'm a big believer that boundaries need intention. Boundaries need thought, that you need to get clear on them before you ask for them. Now, I don't know that this is true in a coffee bar, but here's what I imagine in a coffee bar, that I might be able to ask for what some people might see as a favor, but like, like I might say, listen, I have a commitment every Wednesday night at eight o'clock. I need to be in my car by eight o'clock on Wednesday nights. I know everybody else stays later, but can, I'd like to keep that commitment. Now, I'm setting a boundary for myself. And we might get into why and whatever, but I just set a boundary for myself. I'm not going to get too many of those asks. It's a team sport in a coffee bar, right? And uh, you can only ask for so many, or at least that's what I imagine, Chris. Please tell me if I've got it wrong. But being clear about it ahead of time, 
so that I can say it specifically and directly, not like, hey, you know, there's going to be sometimes when I'm going to have to leave early. It's like, that's not helpful. Being specific, being thoughtful in, in this case means not just uh, being general, but finding out like all of the things that are going to impact that particular workplace. You're, you're not just thinking of yourself, you're thinking of them too. Right, I'm communicating clearly to help the team. I might be asking for a special favor or whatever I'm asking for with my boundary, but I'm being very specific about it. And the, the kind of key here that I want to give people is around thoughtfulness. Don't go in and wing this conversation. Think about it ahead of time. What do you really want? What do you really want? That's what the boundary is about, is what are you protecting here? What are you taking care of? What, what do you want? So that you don't just go in and have a chat or just kind of be vague. You're trying to get a good, solid agreement, but it means you have to step up and ask. And for many people, that's really hard. It may be because, like you say, the, there's that general idea that you want something, but you don't have a specific ask, and so you never do. Or you just say, maybe, yeah, I, I know specifically what I don't want. That's an interesting problem. I think setting a boundary about what I don't want, uh, well, I'll tell you what it makes me think of immediately is I don't want to be spoken to like that. I don't want to be touched like that. So that's setting mm -hmm. a boundary. So yeah, it could be, right? I mean, that's pretty sounds pretty powerful. Yeah. And so I guess very being very specific about what you don't want can be just as effective as setting up what you do want. If it's connected to your values, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because that's what those val those are. Well, okay. So what are we risking in terms of our um, our professional lives and maybe even personal lives if we do not pursue setting boundaries? And we yeah. just continue on the way we are. Well, look, but I think the word risk is a great word to focus on because let's say I need to ask for the 8 p.m. on Wednesday night. I need to be in my car by 8 o'clock. Do, what do I risk by asking that? Do I get seen as not a team player? Do I get punished? Does, you know, there are all kinds of ways that I might pay for that. And think about setting boundaries in our families. Mom, I'm not coming home for Christmas, right? I mean, whatever, setting a boundary. And is there going to be a price to pay for that? I think we all have to consider the risk. What I'm aware of in my life and my side of the continuum was that I don't think I always assessed the risks accurately. I think I made them worse than they really were. I think I worried about them in a way that I have come to find out isn't really valid. But I worried about it a lot. Getting to the place where you have assessed the risk, um, maybe both of, of not setting boundaries and also uh, what will happen if you do set boundaries yeah. might be the first step for either party, whether you're an employee or a boss. Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it, to think of boundaries as situational. Yes, I'm, sometimes I need one thing, sometimes I need another, whether I am the boss or the employee, um, it, that things do change. It's not so much that my values change as a human being, but that I'm aware that situations influence outcomes, and that's okay. Sometimes I'm willing to slide, and I can still clarify the boundary. So I think it's understood that we, we do want boundaries and we need to you know, sort of create an opportunity for ourselves to take the first steps. And the question is, what are, what are kind of the first steps in doing that, uh, assuming that we know that it's something valuable to do to reinforce our values as, as people? Um, what would you say are some of the first things that somebody can do to... Uh, take the first step in creating boundaries that are effective in their life? I think there are two steps, one of which is to listen. Like, are you consistently getting angry in this situation? If you're consistently getting angry, then something's not sitting right with you. Stop, figure it out. What's the value? What boundary do you need to set? Instead of the anger, which is probably not going to help the relationship in the long run, instead of the anger, see if you can get to the boundary. And then you need to be able to ask for it clearly and have a, a conversation that is skilled, that is thoughtful about this boundary that you're talking about, that it's a calm, helpful, connected conversation. 
So those are the two things. Figure it out. What is it? And then have a meaningful, skillful conversation about it. Now, I'm assuming a lot with those two things, but those are the two starting points that I would say. What's an example that we could use to sort of flesh out this a little bit more practically to, you know, a situation Uh, where somebody can follow those steps? Here's one. See if this, if you can relate to this. You have a friend over. It's nighttime. It's a Wednesday. And you have a routine at night that really helps you be successful the next morning. And you know that you pay a price when it doesn't, when it gets badly disrupted. And you're aware that your friend is staying a little too long. But it's your friend. (laughs) You're laughing, right? So look, I don't think there's a right or wrong here. Uh, right? You get to set the boundary wherever you get to set the boundary. But the question is, can you do it? Can you do it in a way that protects yourself? You know what's at stake. Are you sacrificing your well-being tomorrow because you don't want to hurt your friend's feelings tonight? I don't think that's a good balance. That's not you taking care of you. And boundaries are self-care. So mm. I think we maybe need to speak up sooner. Do you know how? So, But that's... Wait, that's the situation, and it made you laugh. So do you want to talk about it? What did, what did that sound like to you? Well, I, when I first think of it, I think there's an assessment of w- what the return on, is going to be on this if your value is more generated on self-care and you are definitely going to suffer as a result of not having your friend, of having your friend over later, then certainly you need to follow through with that. But then some people would say, well, my friendship is means a lot more to me than my routine. But I guess, just like you said earlier, you'd have already had to have made an assessment of what your values are and what's important to you in order to, to even weigh those two options in your mind. And I don't think many of us actually weigh anything in our mind. We just react. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope people do weigh things in their mind. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> I, I'm aware for myself when I was in situations like that and it was difficult for me to set boundaries that I minimized the cost. I was not realistic. Yeah, I know I'm going to suck tomorrow, but it's okay. I, if I can just make it till noon, I'll be fine. And I can pump in the morning and that'll be okay. And I'll just take it easy in the afternoon. All that kind of stuff. Like, wait, wait a minute. Why am I doing that? And by the way, if I'm self-negotiating at that point, I'm not really spending time with my friend because I'm all distracted, right? It's like, yeah, that's where I used to be. I did not assess the risk. I always minimized my own cost. Mm -hmm. I did not value the cost to myself. There's two things that I'm thinking about. Um, And it's two groups of people that we always talk about here on the show. It's the bosses and it's the employees. I want to start with like the employees because, and there's a situation in my mind that happened years ago with somebody. I was a operations manager and this girl was really good at um, sign making and calligraphy. Um, Not hired hired to do it. She was just a barista. Right. Not hired to do it. Um, we found out that she was. We we're like, oh, maybe you can do our chalkboards, right? And write on these menu items and that kind of thing. It turned out to be a way bigger task. And this is not me tooting my own horn, but I was thinking oh, we need to pay her for this. However, yeah. it wasn't exactly yeah. seen that way uh, by people that, uh. who actually could <laughs> pay her. It wasn't I who was in charge of that. Um, and And so the idea was, if we're hiring somebody, um, then we're hiring them and their talents and their services within the hours that we are, they are on shift. So whatever they're doing for us on shift is whatever, fair game. Um, and this is very common in coffee bars where people, I've heard stories where people will even, you know, deliver personal things to the owner's house. Um, it's Whoa. slow in the cafe. Can you help me do this thing? It's like, Whoa. Uh, all right. That's on the other extreme of just over the line, but out of fear of you're the boss, I'm the employee, employees really don't speak up about those things. And it starts with that sign making conundrum and it ends with you like picking up the boss's mail or something weird. Um, (laughs) So what is it that, how how do we navigate a situation like that as an employee when there is a power imbalance, but we recognize that we're kind of being taken advantage of here. I, I Those are fantastic stories, both of them. And I see them as quite different. 
the one about the sign making to me feels obvious. It is truly about skill. And the woman gets to say at any point, hey, guys, you know what? I love doing this, but if I have to do this and my other job and get no extra compensation, you know what? I, I'll just listen. I just won't do the signs. No skin off my nose, right? And she gets to just say that and kind of stop the agreement if she's not going to get paid for it. The other one is quite different because there, it feels like there's personal legal jeopardy involved, right? That somebody is actually crossing a boundary that this is when people get accusations made against them about assault and like, holy crap, oh my God, you want to stay out of that person's life. You want to stay away from that person or make sure that everybody knows what you're doing. Hey, the boss has asked me to run this up to his house. I'm going at one o'clock and everybody needs to know about it. It's like, it's awful. It's terrible. It should not happen. But you need to protect yourself if it happens and risk weigh the risk of saying no. Gee, I'm so sorry I cannot come to your house. That's a big risk, right? What do you think, Chris? I mean, you must hear these stories. What What do you think about this and the issue of boundaries? Well, I guess my, my mind is uh, on the fact that you're trapped, basically, as an employee in some ways, um, in your mind of, you know, I want to please the boss and I want to be down for, you know, whatever the coffee shop needs and Oftentimes that looks like doing a lot of things for um, less money than you should or extra things and staying longer. And, and, and it, again, it kind of veers into the personal. I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to, somebody in that situation can assert their desire to not have that happen anymore. Where you mentioned that the sign maker can say, I'm not going to do the signs anymore. But the risk is there that they will be passed over for a promotion because they're not seen as being down for the co- the the company. They're not a true believer. You know what I mean? Like, and, and so they're like, oh, well, well either I'm going to get another job where people don't take advantage of me, or I'm going to set boundaries for myself. Um, maybe you know retroactively, and I think that's true for a lot of us. Maybe we've we we are where we are. We didn't start just setting boundaries, but we need to set them where we are. So that's the question, I suppose, is how does somebody like that start to, you know, create that boundary? And then um, I I suppose it's just as simple as weighing the risk, but um, it's it's confusing, uh, to be honest, because there is a risk of them upsetting somebody. And fear is what motivates inaction. Well, it's why people have trouble setting boundaries. So... There's a couple ideas that you raised that I'd really want to pick up on that I think are really important. This idea of, oh, I might upset someone. Let's use an example that's not in the coffee bar. Let's imagine you live with a roommate. And let's imagine you're working for a living. Like, you really need every paycheck. You are paying attention to your money. And you go shopping, and you get your groceries, and you put them in the refrigerator, and someone eats them. That was your money. That was like, wait, I don't have enough money to go buy more groceries. Like, that was my food. You need to have a conversation at this point. I hope. <laughs> I hope. By the way, maybe you don't. <laughs> yes. Maybe you really cannot set boundaries because you're afraid I will upset them. That's what stops people at that point. Oh, I don't want to upset you, but. And I want to say, I, I understand that, by the way. I lived there for <laughs> probably half my life. I don't want to upset people. I want to be a nice guy. I want to be seen as likable. I I, I don't want to upset people. I don't have to upset people, right? But it, it led to really crappy boundaries and not being able to ask for things like, that was my food and this isn't fair and could we get a healthy agreement? More and more, Chris, I just want to say, I see setting boundaries as protection, self-care, health, and it has made it much easier for me to be loving and kind on the other side when I don't need to set boundaries. I set fewer of them, but they are more clear than they were. So the idea of they're going to be upset makes me think of something you mentioned in the podcast I listened to, which was the idea of making people feel something (laughs) versus what, (laughs) right? That they're responsible for. So dive into that a little bit for us and explain the difference. Like, what do we need to feel responsible for when it comes to other people's feelings? That's two different questions. Let me take the you make me so angry one first, Mm -hmm, because... mm -hmm. I'll tell you why I'm laughing. 
you know, I, I, I have always loved language. My, my first job was as an actor, and I loved language, and words meant, words had meaning. And you would use one word in this sentence and another word in that sentence for a reason, you know? Like, language had meaning. And I remember, I don't remember how old I was, but I was not young. I was probably maybe 30, I don't know. I remember hearing somebody one day say, she made me so angry. And I remember thinking, I, I, don't, I don't think that's possible. I was just thinking to myself going, that's just as the language says it, that's not possible. How could anybody make you feel anything? Your feelings are contained in you, right? Like, I can't go in there and manipulate them in some way. Like, I don't have that power. And then I started hearing it everywhere. Um, another one that I love is, and oh my, I hear this a lot. He is so intimidating. No, he's not. I, I, I'm sorry. He's not intimidating. Now, we around him might be intimidated by his behavior. Absolutely. But he is not fill in the blank. Right? Because that's when we get into name calling. I feel intimidated around him. That's great. And now I can start to set a boundary. But when it becomes finger pointing, it's a little goofy. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that whole idea mm -hmm. of you make me so angry, well, it's just not real. It doesn't happen that way. It, it is something that I've thought about a lot. And, and I've heard similar thoughts around the fact that it, I choose, if I see something, that stimulus can either give, it gives me the option to choose my reaction. And I try to you know tell my son this about anger, like no one's making you respond this way. You, you've hmm. chosen to do this and here's some other options you have. Now, you know, that kind of goes in one ear and out the other so far, um, <laughs> but it's How eventually going to stick. He's eight. And oh, but so then he's, he's learning. Still That's learning. Great. Yeah, yeah, great. Exactly. Huh. But then we do have this idea that we can have a strong influence on the outcome of what of the situation by the way we behave. And we catastrophize our decisions around boundaries to say, I'll be fired or they're gonna hate me if I do this. Right. So we have this guilt. So, so that's the, I guess that second question that I ask, like how much of this do we take on in a responsible way where it's not toxic to us, but it's, but it's also wise and promotes a positive outcome? Well, I'm with you about promoting a positive outcome. We want to preserve the relationship or enhance the relationship, right? I mean, that's why we might be fearful. It's like, I don't want to damage the relationship, right? So... I'm with you. It's where I get again to this idea of getting clear on what I'm asking for so that I'm not fire gunning all over the place, but also so that I don't take it personally. In other words, I'm going to say to you, uh, uh, let me just go back to my, I have a commitment at eight o'clock on Wednesdays. I need to be in my car by eight o'clock on Wednesdays. Um, now I'm going to ask that without apology, right? I'm going to, just put it out there. I have no idea how that's going to land on you. So you might explode. I'm not responsible for that. You might sit down and go, oh, are you okay? You, I don't know how you're going to react. I do think I need to be thoughtful if I know you well. I might be able to predict what time would be a good time to do it. Like, don't do it in the middle of a rush. Um, uh, maybe around privacy, issues of directness or not. I mean, you would know that. But what happens next their reactions, their feelings, their responses, you have no control over it and no responsibility for it. Mm. It's not yours. If you think about boundaries as protecting things that are yours, self-protection, th their feelings are nowhere inside that circle of yours. Their feelings don't belong there. And by the way, if they try and put you there, this is the Jewish mother, right? I mean, I grew up with a Jewish mother. They're trying to make you feel guilty. Like, really, truly, you forgot my birthday? You forgot my birthday? It's like, no, mommy didn't forget your birthday. You know, like, <laughs> but that's her take, right? Because she wants to be inside my circle. That's a mm -hmm. kind of classic Jewish mom thing. Bad boundaries. It's my job. It's not her job. It's my job to say, you can't come in here regardless of how upset that makes her, because that's not about me. And that's so hard. That's a really hard thing to kind of look at somebody who's upset with you and think, that's not about me? 
<laughs> it's hard to do, mm. but I do think it's okay. true. I think it's accurate. You get more comfortable with it as you do it, I suppose. At first, it must feel very uncomfortable to assert that boundary and say, that doesn't belong here. And then they like wait for the explosion. And then the next time you do it, maybe there's less of a a, a tinge to it. Is, is that the case? Does it get easier as you practice it? You know, I got chills when you just said that, Chris, because I have a memory of... Uh, prepping a conversation where I was going to ask for something and I was going to do all my best practices. I was not going to apologize and I was not going to over explain. I was going to keep it really simple. And I remember the anxiety that I had going into the conversation and then nothing happened. Like it was like, there was not even a speed bump. It was so easy and smooth and it was over. And I had this exhilaration like, oh my God, that worked. So (laughs) yes, your idea of Practice it a little and it gets easier and easier. Yes, where it used to take me, I'm not kidding, it used to take me time to be thoughtful about my boundaries and really kind of go away and reflect and craft them and have a dialogue. I do them on the fly now. And it's easier Mm. just because I'm more familiar to do it. So you mentioned in the uh, episode uh, incremental thinking and earlier today, uh, and earlier in this conversation, you're talking about that continuum and that incremental progress from the doormat to somewhere in the middle or the healthy uh, part of that continuum. And and what you just mentioned is that you've got to the point where you have incrementally increased your skill in, in you have this intuition uh, about what to do and how to do it for you, the benefit of, uh, you know, self-care, right? And setting good boundaries. So talk a little bit more about incremental thinking. Why is it important that we embrace that idea uh, when we're setting boundaries, it feels so crappy, and uh, and it's not a light switch. So it's very possible. I mean, I'll I'll just speak for myself. It was a long journey for me, and I don't think the journey's over. But I'm certainly better than I was. I'm healthier than I was. Um, but it was hard at first, and and especially when it's hard at first, you want to quit. You want to stop. That didn't work, or it makes me too anxious, or oh, it doesn't really matter, or I mean, all those reasons why you give yourself excuses not to change. But when you do incremental improvement, look, I just want to be 5% better next time. Just 5% mm. better. So I, I know I'm still going to suck, and that's okay, but I'm going to just, just a 5% improvement. And then I makes me more thoughtful. You just said something about you know having intuition about getting better, and my feeling, just because of how I like to work, is I do have intuition about it, but I want tools. I want scripts. I want words to say. I want language. That's helpful for me. Again, I said before, I love language. Language has meaning for me. So when, when I can read a book like Crucial Conversations and get a whole bunch of scripts, that's really helpful to me because I can pull them out in a certain situation. And that's one way to set boundaries is just learn how to. In fact, I have a PDF that I'd love to uh, share with your listeners. I didn't make it, but I found it. And it's so great about boundaries and it has a whole bunch of language on it and it, I thought it was really good, Chris. I'd love to share it with your listeners. Oh, yeah, that'd be wonderful. We'll we'll provide a link in the show notes for that. Thank you. Yeah, it was created by a group called therapistaid.com. And it seems like it's written for therapists to help their clients think about boundaries. And it's very simple, bullet pointy, really excellent, good examples. Um, it's really helpful. I, I liked it a lot. That's really awesome. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that, well, first of all, that's why I think, um, you know, your podcast is so great is that it provides these examples. And often I think the, you know, examples that you use are scripts for us and community, uh, a community of ideas uh, gives us sort of the permission to just go ahead and take the next step. And I talk to people a lot at Coffee Fest trade shows, for example, who, you know, funny, I try to be funny when I ask this on stage, like how many of you right now can think of at least two people that you need to have a hard conversation with that's back at your cafe? And, you know, most every hand goes up. Oh, I bet. And yeah, sure. It, yeah. it is just um, amazing how there's always going to be this tension and you're always tending to these things, right? Um, and we do need to accept the fact, I think, that even if you set a boundary, and I'd be interested to know what you think about this, that 
that boundary is there to offer resistance to something that's not simply going to go away simply because you have a boundary. It's, it's there to provide resistance that will kind of always be there. I, I want to draw a distinction like what you talked about at Coffee Fest and, you know, do people have people to talk to? I want to be sure that boundaries don't sound like feedback because that they're not the same. You know, feedback is performance feedback. I want to talk mm. to you about how you are performing your job or what your responsibilities are to the team or whatever, but that's feedback. It's performance management. Boundaries, I think, are based on values. Now, it might be for the community, like, for example, it might be how we talk to each other in this store. Absolutely. It might be for everybody. But it might be just me around... Um, this is how I like something, or this is what I prefer does not happen. It might be personal, but it might be for the team. But they're values-based. This is how we talk to each other because we hold this value. So, But that's not feedback. Do you know what I mean? I, I just think yeah, they're different. That's a good distinction. That's good. Yeah. Um, so I guess maybe the, the follow-up to that would be, is there ever a time where we, I, I suppose we have to weigh this, but we do have to sign on for a corporate set of values when we are employed somewhere. Yeah. And that's going to sometimes be inconvenient. And I've definitely seen it where people are that dragon, where <laughs> in spite of having signed on to uphold the values and job description and all this stuff, it's almost as if they were like, wait, what are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> what, what job description? What responsibilities? This is what I want to do. I suppose there is an acceptable form of allowing sort of your desires to fall by the wayside for the corporate good, but how do you recognize when you need to create boundaries versus where something is merely inconvenient because it's just work? Yeah, right. Listen, I, I think when we sign on for any kind of work, we understand that we live within someone else's rule book, right? That's why there is an employee's handbook. There better be. And you should read it and find out what, what your rights are and how people are going to treat you and what's expected. You should. And they're setting their boundaries. That's actually their job. They're paying you to come into their circle and live in their world. That's They're paying you to do that. And if it is you know personally inconvenient for your personal uh, values at the moment, then please don't come in. Then we're not trying to violate your boundaries. We're telling you how to play by our rules if you would like us to pay you. Then there are individual boundaries, how people individually speak to me, how people individually touch me, how people individually, whatever it might be, those are going to be my boundaries, right? Issues of fairness, those kinds of things. Am I going to speak up or not? Um, but yes, we do live under the employee's the employer's umbrella, and we cash their check. Yeah, that's true. We do. I feel like a lot of owners will use the first version, that that manual and the v values and everything else, to sort of broad brush a bunch of personal stuff and say, well, we're, we, we're talking to you like this because it's, you know, you, you signed on to work here, and this is what we think brings about the execution of or the realization of this value, this vision. And so that they, it's sort of like a, an excuse. So we're using a corporate value as an excuse for personal affronts. Yeah, possibly, I'm sure. This is where I think people need to have some fine tuning. Um, this is where I am really sad to say it. Young people get taken advantage of because young people don't really have their boundaries set yet. But, you know, somebody walk in that store at, you know, 35 or 40, they might go, no, I'm not going to do this. I'll find someplace else <laughs> to work, right? So, but it's true, I think, that happens, and it's how we learn. And, you know, I think that 20-year-old who grows up and looks back and goes, I had a horrible boss. I had a boss who had no values. I had a boss who really ran a horrible store. Yeah, that's going to be that person's story. That's true. Well, you, you kind of teed this up pretty well because I really wanted to ask about the idea of setting up boundaries for other people who, for whatever reason, maybe it's because they're, they're uh, you know, young and they don't know what their boundaries are quite yet, but you as the boss, you know, and you've been around the block, you've been that person, that 30, 40-year-old veteran in this industry, and you see the need to sort of help them develop 
boundaries for for their benefits like how do you do that and can you do that in fact uh with with somebody who needs them but just isn't really making any um steps towards that so i was traveling recently and was in a community where there was a young woman um probably 30 years old maybe a little more who was sleeping with her mother every night and they cuddled and talked all day and went shopping and it was a very intimate relationship and the conversation among those of us who were not them right was is this a healthy relationship it looks kind of crazy but like it looks healthy i mean who knows what goes on in any relationship but like it looked like such an obvious boundary violation but we had no idea maybe it isn't don't know i don't get to set boundaries for anybody else i might worry about people i might worry about how someone is being treated i might worry about how someone is being spoken to but is it my job to set that person's boundaries? No, it's not. It's not in my circle. Now, I might want to have a conversation with them and say, I'm worried about you. There's something I see that is upsetting to me. I, I might choose to say that. I might. But I, then do I get to set the boundaries for them? No. Well, then I guess a, a workaround on that, not that we're trying to do this, but but setting up an environment where it's less likely that boundaries are going to be crossed or more likely that we are going to encourage people to think about these things is to be more specific in our own corporate language about behaviors that line up with values. So you mentioned manuals, for instance, um, have a lot of sexual harassment policies, for example. So we're forecasting that in a group of people who are, you know, during the workday under stress, uh, under pressure, you know, elbow to elbow, working behind the bar, there's going to be opportunities that we could forecast uh, are, are, are going to create tension. And maybe there's going to be boundaries that cross uh, or get crossed. And so maybe we could head that off by, you know, predictively and preemptively stating those types of things in our material. So it wouldn't be such a personal conversation. It would just be more like a you're, you're calling it before it happens sort of thing. I think it would be great. Listen, I a concern that I have, I don't know if it's true, Chris, you, you would know this better than I. A concern that I have is that in a, in a kind of setting like a coffee bar, things move so quickly. There is so many words spoken over the course of a day. It's hard to always know what you've heard. It's hard to remember everything. It's hard to look at that employee manual and really internalize it. I mean, it's hard. I may not know certain things. Um, and I think one of the managers and employers jobs is to be sure that people have heard it. That may or may not be a boundary setting conversation. That may be again, kind of training. It may be feedback. It may be all kinds of things, but it might be boundaries might be. Um, but over the course of the day, working elbow to elbow with people, boy, my heart goes out that like all the time I can imagine that I might have to say to you all the time of like, please don't do that to me. Please don't do that to me. Please don't do that to me. I may need to say that a bunch. I may. Yeah. And then you might have to go to your boss uh, if it doesn't stop because then they will have to step in and enforce your own personal boundary. Well, then you have a conversation with your boss about it. It's not automatic that your boss is going to come to your defense. Your boss might see it very differently. Your boss might have a different solution. Your boss, I mean, who knows what your boss is going to say? That's that whole thing of you can't predict the response, right? But you're sure, going to ask sure. for your boundary. You're going to ask for some help. Hey, this is happening. This is why it's upsetting to me. What can we do about it? But I'm not going to necessarily go to my boss and say, make Tim stop. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, that's, we're not in fourth grade. It's not, it's not the deal. So yeah, I, I think you're going to go to your boss and ask for some help. Hey, I've asked a lot. It's not changing. What can we do here? This is really feeling like a boundary violation to me. Like, can we get it fixed? Then I don't know what your boss is going to do. And I suppose you have the ability to select where you work once you know that you're in a place that doesn't have the same values. Again, like you mentioned earlier, you can say, well, I want to be in a place where I feel like I don't have to deal with this kind of thing. Maybe. And, you know, listen, it's a luxury. It's a luxury to be able. I, I hope that's true. My wish. I'm serious, Chris. I feel this so deeply. My wish is that when people are unhappy, that they could just walk out and go find another job. And I just know that for some people, it's not possible. It's too disruptive. It's too whatever. Yeah. And they kind of don't feel like they have that as an option. 
But my wish is that when people are in a workspace where it does feel like a violation day after day, I hope they can leave. I agree with you. I hope they can. The the one thing that I, I want to ask about here as we wrap up is the idea of boundaries for the boss who is usually they'll burn themselves out by doing everything, wearing a lot of hats, mm. always being in the cafe, always sort of um, broadcasting to people by virtue of their position that they are uh, ever present, ever ready to respond and feel very guilty about setting boundaries for themselves. Like, don't call me on this day because it's, I'm the owner of this business. I feel like I need to eat, sleep, breathe this thing. And anything right. related to boundaries feels like a violation of my commitment to completely sacrifice myself for the benefit of everyone else. Wow. <laughs> what do you say to the person like that? How's that working for you? It sounds hard. <laughs> right. Right? I mean, it sounds like you're going to sacrifice your marriage. You're going to sacrifice being a, a, a parent. It's going to suck. But if that's if that's your choice, is that your coffee bar is going to be your baby and you're going to devote your life to it, people around you are going to suffer. I guess it's a legitimate choice. It's not one that I would make. And then I would ask, why? Why are you choosing to put your coffee bar over the, over your life? Like, what would happen if you actually turned towards your life? Find the systems that will support you. Find the second in command who will take the times when you're going to turn your phone off. I mean... Come on, create a business and make it self-sustaining. I think the greatest honor could be that you retire or you get hit by a car and your your business goes on because it's so healthy. But mm -hmm. if you're the only person who can turn the crank, like, well, okay, I just think you're going to pay a price for it. Right. Well, when you put it that way, it helps put it in perspective that the negative results that are at the other end of not setting those boundaries and not developing systems to support those um, they are not top of mind in the moment. It's much easier to simply do it yourself. And, you know, down the line, you just wake up one day and it's, wow, I've been taken advantage of or I've allowed this to happen. Yes, but I think when you, when you think consciously about your values, am I showing up the way I want to show up? Did this make me happy today? Am I okay? I mean, really kind of becoming as conscious as you can and saying, how am I? And finding out where your values are being rubbed against. Because most likely they are. And it might be your roommate. It might be your partner. It might be your kids. I mean, it could be anybody, right? Our, our values get bumped all the time in this lifetime. It's, it's a hard life. And so being able to set boundaries is that idea of self-care and being clear about what's inside my circle, right? That there are certain things. Look, I've got grown children. It is so interesting to let them out of my circle. Like their lives are not mine anymore. Like how bizarre. Yeah. They were my life to care for for so long and now they're not. Talk about boundaries, right? That's, I just had to kind of refigure what I did. It's not mine and getting clear on what is and what isn't. <laughs> it's our life's work, isn't it? It's, it sounds like a never ending task, but one that we have to embrace. I do think it's I do think it's part of going through life, right? Is where are my boundaries now? Because my values are situational. And knowing what I feel, I mean, look, I don't feel the same way as I felt 20 years ago. I don't. And I don't think that's a problem. I don't think that's because I'm a flip-flopper. I think it's because I've evolved in my life. And so, of course, my values have evolved with me. So, yeah, I, I take it as a point of pride. And, yes, it is the continuing, ongoing, never-ending work of being alive in a certain way. Well... This has really been fascinating. I, I, I feel like uh, just a reiteration uh, of next steps for people thinking about boundaries now a lot more at the end of this conversation than they were previously. Um, maybe it is that assessment of values, but uh, this week, after people close this podcast player, what's the first step for them that is going to yield the best results and how should they proceed from there? Okay, I got three. <laughs> I know you asked for one, but I'm going to give you three. Number one is come back to you in your show notes and get this PDF. This PDF is simple. It is incredibly simple and friendly and will give you the answer to Chris's question. So it's perfect. That's number one. Number two is where are you upset? Track the pattern. What upsets you? Because that's where your values are getting buffed. And uh, yeah, 
So pay attention to that. And then three, ask yourself what you want. If that's upsetting to me, if that's what my value is, what do I want? And figure it out. And who do you need to tell? And what's that conversation going to be like? You always have great insights here. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you on the show. Where can people learn more about what you do, uh, your podcast, and your uh, consulting? Oh, well, thank you for asking. So the podcast is The Look and Sound of Leadership. You can find it wherever they sell fine podcasts. <laughs> and uh, I run a company called Essential Communications. We're coaches. And uh, we're at EssentialCom, with two M's, dot com. EssentialCom.com. Excellent. And uh, I've mentioned it on the show here before, but again, um, definitely need to subscribe to Tom's podcast. It's essential. Well, if ironically enough, it is essential, uh, I think, in terms of <laughs> insights like this. Um, very clearly communicated and insightful content always. And again, pleasure to have you, Tom. Can I add one little thing about that? Um, if people are into PDFs, I think you know, Chris, we've got a ton of them for free on our website. Please go help yourself. They're all about this kind of stuff, communicating with your people. So help yourself. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Well, I hope that you enjoy that conversation. So much to kind of chew on here. And as we go forward and try to apply this wisdom into our own lives and into our businesses, it is important, I think, to reiterate the idea of incremental thinking in that we are definitely needing to give ourselves time to develop clarity around these things because they can be very emotional and we need to make sure that we're giving proper time and thoughtfulness to this and uh, take the first steps in the right way. Uh, one of those steps, of course, is downloading that PDF that Tom mentioned. You can do that in the show notes and maybe re-listen to this episode also just to really get it ingrained. But the more we can apply the kind of wisdom that we heard today about boundaries in our own lives and in our coffee shops, uh, the healthier the workplace is going to be, I think. So a big thank you to Tom Henschel for joining us on the show again. We really appreciate your time and wisdom, Tom. If you want to learn more about what Tom has on offer, you can just find it all over at EssentialCom.com. That's EssentialCom with two M's. That's in the show notes. Definitely subscribe to the Look and Sound of Leadership as well. And now if you have questions about today's episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, then I would invite you to email me, chris at keystotheshop.com. And that's where you can also reach me if you're interested in Keys to the Shop Consulting, working with me one-on-one -on -one to help you with any kind of challenges you have in your new coffee business or your established coffee business. Chris at keys to the shop.com. Now about a few days from the airing of this episode is going to be coffee fest, Los Angeles. It's going to be a great time. Hopefully if you're hearing this and you have the opportunity to go, you are going to go because there's so much to offer there. Coffee fest has been going on three decades and it's not just a trade show, but it is a hub of unmatched accessible resource for coffee retailers like you to get equipped with the skills and knowledge it takes to run a great business. There is free and accessibly priced workshops, lectures, panel discussions, and trainings. You have the trade show floor where you get to interact with great vendors, as well as competitions like Latte Art and the Cold Brew Competition. And on top of that, you get to be amongst a group of people who all share the same kind of goal, which is let's be successful in specialty coffee in our shops and uh, it's really a great time. So Los Angeles coming up here, it is going to start on the 27th of August and then the last uh, Coffee Fest for 2022 is going to be in Seattle later on at the end of September. Go to coffeefest.com, register today for the shows, use the code KEYS to get 50% off your registration, K-E-Y-S. When you register, get 50% off you and all of your team for the remaining 2022 Coffee Fest shows. So hope to see you there. I'll be presenting some uh, talks and doing some latte art judging. And please do say hello. Again, go find out more information at coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our show today, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate every one of you. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, share it with a friend, and have an amazing day. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop.